it on a broader scale so that we can get that felony arrest. So there is some of that going on. And again, it depends on the department. It depends on the leadership. But the most serious thing in this state that we have to deal with to gain an acceptance by law enforcement is we have to influence the change at the top. Because when the change at the top comes, those young officers on the street are going to do what they're told. They're going to do what's expected of them. Many of them already agree with legalizing marijuana. Many of them will tell you in private that it's a wheel spinner, it's a waste of time. But we have to look at cause and effect and we have to expose it. One thing that's hugely problematic to me on many, many levels is this thing called asset seizure. And marijuana plays a major role in promoting asset seizure. The federal government has an equitable sharing program with local law enforcement, and they have it for one reason and one reason only, so that they can leverage local law enforcement to do the job they want done, rather than to do the job that they're hired for as peace officers in the community to look after uh, crimes against persons and crimes against uh, property. They want drug warriors, and so they leverage the police departments with things like grants and asset seizures and task forces. And over the years, that leveraging has become what I call uh, uh, turning many police departments into uh, what, what I call policing for profit. And they have, begun, they, they have become addicted to that drug money that's provided to them by the federal government. And they have forgotten that they swore an oath to their state and that this is a sovereign state. And they now, especially you in the marijuana community, the medical marijuana community, you know what's happening now. Instead of city councils and local police departments going to Sacramento and working out their problems with regulation and control, the cities themselves are now running directly to the federal government. And they're, they're using the federal government to use asset seizure laws when this state has its own. Well, that's a terrible violation of their oath of office, and it's a terrible violation of their social contract with the people. California leads the nation in asset seizure. And those most responsible, if you live in a small community, take a look at what your small community is doing. City like Pomona, it's bringing in the, the most money in this state. They ended up last year with nine cars. Now, when we implemented asset seizure, when the federal government implemented it, they said they're going after kingpins. That's why they need that law. They got to get the kingpins. They got to take the kingpins down. The average asset seizure is fifteen thousand dollars. How many of you have gone out and tried to get a lawyer to represent you in federal court? You can't get one for less than 50000 most of the time. That's what I'm told. So it's the existence of these kind of programs coupled with and married to organizations in Sacramento like the Chiefs of Police Association and the Narcotic Officers Association led by uh, uh, John Lavelle, I think his name is. And there is not a piece of legislation that comes up that these guys don't oppose if it has anything to do with mandatory sentencing, harsher penalties, keeping the marijuana laws and the, and the other drug laws in place. And there's not a lot of, uh, uh, there's nothing that they, they support that has to do with uh, a, a compassionate uh, moves on the criminal justice system. So we can recruit. And LEAP does that, and off of your next question, I'll, I will get into that for you. Uh, we can recruit uh, the young police officers off the street and hear their attitudes, but the change needs to take place at the top. And we need to expose all of these wrongs, asset seizure, quotas, attitudes. We need to, we need to focus on, on what a sovereign state means what it means to raise your right hand and swear an oath to the Constitution. 
we need to focus on those things because, in my opinion, law enforcement, because of the war on drugs, has lost its professionalism. Thank you, Stephen. And amongst this, in this giant struggle for power and money, how do we exactly, as activists, work with law enforcement, both current and former, to hopefully um, kind of soften this divide between us, bring them on board with our uh, reform initiatives, and also, what, what do you see as keeping law enforcement away? Is it is it job security? Is it um, just the social stigma amongst your peers? Uh, all of the above. It's, um, give you an example. Um, I just traveled across the country uh, with Javier Cecilia's Car Caravan for Peace. We visited uh, Good friend Sam Sabazar, he traveled with us and, and shot every and shot every uh, inch of video uh, he could and uh, where he couldn't. He collaborated with five other filmmakers uh, that were on the caravan, and so we hope to produce um, some very uh, interesting things for you all in the future. Uh, anyway. In, in those travels, uh, we did everything, uh, demonstrations, marches, and of course, everywhere we were, uh, there were uh, local police, policing uh, and uh, providing security for what we were doing as a, uh, as a uh, caravan. And I made a point everywhere we went, every chance I had, to give a lead pamphlet to the officers, to get them my car, to tell them what we do, to bring their attitudes out, to ask them to join us, to tell them how we can protect them, how we do protect them. And uh, at one place, uh, we were in uh, Chicago. Uh, we had a demonstration. Uh, we, uh, we built a, a SUV and made it look like a police car, only we uh, dressed it up with the, uh, uh, the LEAP logos. And uh, we did look like a police car, and we led the caravan. And, so I went up to the officers to ask them uh, if, if they could uh, help me get it in. And I started chatting with this uh, young woman and I was telling her her story and, and I said, so, uh, you know, uh, come and join us and uh, you, you have your First Amendment rights off duty. And she nodded and she said, um, you know, I'd love to, but I have a three-year-old at home. And what was she, she was telling me is she said, I have a job, I have to provide for my family. And the social pressures, the cultural pressure, the peer pressure, the administrative pressure, those are all pressures that, that keep a, a, a lot of cops from speaking out and, uh, and telling their stories. Uh, we do in LEAP have uh, people that are on duty. We have a, a functioning, a working prison warden uh, uh, was on our national board. We have an uh, active duty officer in uh, uh, Canada, and we have several others, but uh, they are truly, truly the, the courageous ones, and uh, I assure you that their, their careers suffer when they speak out. Many of you may have read uh, about the uh, young border patrolman a uh, couple of months on the job, he had heard about LEAP and he was sitting on the border and watching for uh, violations and said to his partner, he said, you know, I was reading about LEAP and he seemed to have some pretty good ideas about this marijuana thing and whatnot. And his partner reported him, he's fired. Well, work gets out like that and it's problematic. I, I, think, I, I think the guy has a great lawsuit, but uh, still, he's not providing for his family at the moment. So uh, what can we do? to help these young police officers uh, uh, around. And I say, any police officer, and I'm sure all of you know police officers, you have some in your families, uh, you know them as neighbors or whatever. Number one, don't treat them as an enemy because they have a different view. Uh, uh, they all came from this society of ours. Uh, and so they all have differing opinions and different experiences. And then they went into police academies and they got buried in the cultures, 
and uh, they were told things like I was told, and you know, I thought all drug users were bad guys when I came out of the cabin, because that's what they told me. I didn't know any different. And then I found out for myself. So don't treat them as an enemy, but treat them as someone who can benefit by the education that you can give them, and give them that education in a way that they can absorb it, that they're not defensive, and, and, and then you can help them uh, by referring them to LEAP. And we will nurture them. We will give them the materials to join. We let them be anonymous. We have letters that they can, if they want to come out, we have letters that they can deliver to their command officers that says, uh, here's what I'm going to do, off duty, no uniform, no reference to the department, uh, and it's my First Amendment right. So we help in that way, and we help educate them on how to, uh, to do that. So I, I would say to you to help bring uh, law enforcement into this mix, do the first thing I talked about, about the, the top echelons, and then with the young guys, because the young guys are going to promote. One day they're going to be running these departments. One day they're going to be the managers. And so help them along, get them to think, and when their thinking reaches a, a level that you think is worthwhile, refer them to LEAP and we'll, we'll put them on board and we'll, we'll help uh, build their courage and, and we'll help get the job done. It's a common theme here, obviously, that uh, a lot of people very much fear for their, uh, their lifestyles, their employment, their families. And um, turning next to our next panelist, we have Paul Kuhn, who is the chairman, chairman of the board, and he was previously the treasurer of the board, and before that, about eight million other things. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, I would like to discuss briefly um, the 65 and up group. These are uh, starting to move out, and get the boomers are starting to come out, and they're starting to become of age and retire, and but we still lack support in that group. Any polling will show that 65 and up is still a weak spot of ours. What can we do? to kind of inform these people and bring them on board when so many things about cannabis, especially the medical benefits, would be so useful to them? Well, I think uh, one of the encouraging factors is that if you look at the percent of increase in marijuana use by age category, the largest increase in the last few years has come from those of us who are over, I don't remember whether it's 55 or 60 or 65, but... Well, 45 for you, Paul, right? That's uh, uh, 20 years ago, maybe, yeah. Um, you know, part of that's just natural that folks who started using in their 30s and 40s and 50s enjoy marijuana, and maybe even as, they're, as they get older and they have aches and ailments um, and just want to have a good time, um, they continue <laughs> using and maybe even tell their friends about it. So Ann may have some thoughts on that too, and I suppose we could both address a, uh, a couple of demographics that the numbers are not good enough. That's the over 65, it's increasing, but it's still a lagging group. And Southerners, uh, we're, not, uh, we're, we're kind of catching up too, but it's uh, been slow, and, and Republicans. But I'd have to say, you can't just blame the Republicans. I'm, I'm kind of a recovering Republican now. I've gone over, gone over to the Libertarian side, and I'll be voting for Gary Johnson. Again, at least I'm voting uh, Libertarian again. But you know, when you look at the numbers, the Democrats really aren't much better. Uh, we are just uh, behind with all uh, active politicians. So it's, it was alluded to this morning, it's not until you retire from office that you can come out and say, well, I was wrong all those years, and uh, we really ought to think about legalizing marijuana. And that's, that is a very, that's taking place with active politicians, as I think maybe Alan pointed out this morning. Uh, more and more are beginning to speak out when they're in office, and maybe a few are even finding out that you can gain votes by being for marijuana. And I saw, I think yesterday or today, that the Republican candidate for U.S. Senate in the state of Washington, and by the way, if you look at how that campaign is coming in Washington, thanks to Rick Steves and many other individuals, the uh, 
the editorials, the major newspapers, the sheriff, the actually active law enforcement as well has retired or uh, endorsing that. And so the Republican candidate for U.S. Senate, who I think is behind uh, his Democratic opposition, came out in favoring uh, the initiative yesterday. And my guess is he picked up a few votes. And the good thing about that may be that I hope he's going to kind of push the Democratic candidate to endorse um, 502 as well. So again, that's an example of a Republican who's willing to speak out, and there are a few, and there will be more that really begins to change the landscape. Now, why is it so difficult for Republicans? I mean, you look at the principles of the party, you know, limited government, uh, rights of indi individuals to make up their own mind, that uh, when programs don't work, we should uh, shut them down and replace them. I mean, marijuana prohibition meets all of those criteria. But it's just hard for Republicans to kind of wrap their mind around that and accept that they should do it. And I think it is, maybe as Sabrina mentioned, it's the, it's the kind of moral issue because the government in the 30s did a very effective job of demonizing marijuana and marijuana users. Even the name, you know, it was used, it was, it was known as cannabis in the, the tens and the twenties and the thirties. And so Harry Anslinger finds this more foreign sounding name out of line. And people didn't even know what it was. The AMA, American Medical Association, was late to the game in opposing the law because they read in the papers, they look at the agenda in Congress, and they're going to do something with something called marijuana. They didn't realize that it was cannabis until the last minute. So it's been very effective. The charges that were made, we look back at them now, and they're just embarrassing racist, unscientific. You know, marijuana, we need to prohibit it because of its effect on the degenerate races, which was anybody that wasn't uh, white. And I expect that really included Italians and Jews at the time as being uh, degenerate. And uh, what else are other things? You know, marijuana makes darkies feel they're as good as white men. Uh, well, that's really a dangerous drug. So the law gets all the books and it's tainted and, and demonized. And then in the, just about the time, some of, it, of that is beginning to fade away, some of it, because it's, it's very effective, it lingers on. About the time it's beginning to fade away, then we have, uh, you know, the Vietnam War protest and the hippies, the dirty hippies burning the American flag, and what do they do? How do they smoke this marijuana? So it created an image and a fear that's going to be very hard to overcome. But we are overcoming it. We have a majority of support now. And the door for many people will be uh, medical marijuana, which has majority support, I think, among all just parties. About everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just about everyone, and uh, including uh, Southerners and old people and Republicans and Democrats. Um, and you know, the, uh, our opponents say, well, they're just trying to crack open the door. That's all medical marijuana is. They get the foot of the door, and then they're going to be able to want to be able to use it recreationally. And the uh, in, in one sense, the honest answer is uh, yes. That's exactly right. Because once it's legal for medicine, and once individuals see their next door neighbor or their cousin, or in my case, my spouse, member of their family using marijuana, and they're you know, they're not kind of going crazy and it's really effective as medicine. It begins to change your whole idea. So if, if nothing else, the, the move for medical marijuana really does have a beneficial effect in just legalizing marijuana for all of us who want to use it. And you know, once it's legal, it's available one way or another for everybody. You don't have to go, if you're a patient, and get your car and you can go to the state store or to the neighbor who's growing it, whatever. So it's, Things are, uh, things are beginning uh, to change, and I think someday there actually will be uh, mostly seniors, all uh, strong majority of seniors, strong majority of Southerners, and yes, even a strong majority of Republicans whose eyes are open to the truth. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cannabis bags.
And I want to bring in our, uh, our next panelist here on this point of Republicans, and I know she has some strong views. Our next panelist is uh, Ms. Ann Lee, who is a strong Republican supporter and advocate from Texas. And as you may all know her, she's also Richard Lee's mom, so we all have a lot to thank her for. feel that uh, perhaps the Republican Party has, has lost sight of its principles in, yeah. in the past couple of years, and especially with how that relates to how they viewed the drug war, if you'd like to expand on that a little. I'm going to digress for just a minute. Something was said earlier that I asked you all. Drug user. Is a drug user a man on his way home from work who stops at the ice house and has a beer? Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> drug users and we don't think that. We right. do not have that in the mind of the public, do we? No. no. We should. Okay, that's not what I'm here for. <laughs> but, I, but when he said that, that hit me because I do know people who stop at the high house and have a beer. Not, not, in my, my, not my husband, but the many of them do. All right, I'm in there and I am a Republican. Republican for me, but let me give you a little bit of history. I grew up in Louisiana. Went to the University of Texas, met my husband. He not only made me a Texan, but a Republican. <laughs> for which I'm grateful. Why are we Republicans? Republicans believe three things very firmly. The ones who stay true to the principles. Limited government, fiscal responsibility, and less intrusion in your private life. <laughs> Does not the drug war fly in the face of every one of those? Yeah. Now before 1990, I thought marijuana was the weed of the devil. <laughs> and, but even if it were true, why did I not realize that prohibition is not the answer? It only took my heroine, Pauline Martin Saban, of the alcohol prohibition days, it only took her 13 years to realize that prohibition didn't make it better. All it did was make it easier for kids to get alcohol because the saloon keeper didn't worry about a license. Does a drug dealer worry about a license to sell marijuana? But anyway, I thought marijuana was terrible. Until our very wonderful son found that it was good for him. And Richard looked at us and said, Mom and Dad, marijuana is good for me. And I didn't want to believe it. Because I had followed hook, line, and sinker for all the propaganda that my government has put out. And I have come to question my government a lot more than I ever did. I still wave the flag. This is still the best country. <coughs> we have a cancer that we have not cured. A cancer of racism started with slavery, and it didn't end with Jim Crow. And many people do not even know what Jim Crow is. This is a revelation to me. <laughs> and many people do not know that in the South, <coughs> after Abe fleet freed the slaves, the Southern white Democrats passed Jim Crow laws. Do you know, many of you do not know that it was illegal for whites and blacks to go to the same school, <coughs> for whites and blacks to marry. Those were laws. Jim Crow laws. And so why now when I say we have the new Jim Crow, which has become my Bible, <laughs> and a, a book that haunts me, and everybody that was, I'm a precinct chairman for the Republican Party, and if you want my endorsement, if you were running for, running for a criminal district bench, you had to read this book. <laughs> a bit because when I came out to Oakland in June of 2010 to work on Prop 19, they, they thought of the Oakland Tribune thought it was pretty interesting. And here was this 81-year-old white Southern Republican coming to work on Prop 19. So they interviewed me. And I made this statement and I kept this because I thought it was a little bit prophetic. I said on June 25th, 2010, the drug war is so bad it's the most racist thing we have done since Jim Crow. 
I had that in print. I actually said that. Not too long later, Michelle Alexander, a very, a very liberal ACLU lawyer, wrote this great book, and I have promoted it all over the place. It is a good book. It is a good book because it is true, and she has so much credibility because she takes Clinton. She does not give him any slack at all. And why the Democrats and the blacks think Clinton is a hero, I do not know. You have to answer that question for me. Because he was horrible with his drug war policies in the eight years, along with Lee Brown from Houston, African-American, police chief, mayor. And I confronted him. You might notice I'm not too bashful. <laughs> I went up to him about, my husband and I were out and we saw him, and I went up to him and I said, Mr. Brown, are you familiar with the new Jim Crow? He almost turned white. <laughs> But he did not like to be reminded of it. Because he was not good if he called the blacks his people. He was not good to them when he was a drug czar. Now, where am I going with this? The drug war is against all of the principles of the Republican Party in which I believe. You cannot be a Tea Party, a Tea Party, and believe in the war on drugs because it flaunts fiscal responsibility, it flaunts smaller government, and it certainly wants to intrude in your private life. And the other thing that I cherish most of all is the freedom that this country usually offers. But I would have to say, in the light of the drug war, we have taken that freedom away from way too many young blacks and Latinos. Amen. And it's not that they do drugs any more than us whites do. Not at all. But that, that, that is my story, and I believe in my party. And by the way, about six years ago, when we first had a medical marijuana legislation in Austin, which didn't go anywhere, but I had three Republican women's groups pass resolutions in support of it. So I want you to say, Republicans, some of them not as old as I am, but they're more your age. <laughs> who, do, who do not support the drug war. And that's 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 my story. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good to see you for Richard Fowler's passion and I have to inspire from. He has more courage than I do, sir. <laughs> Well, you raised them right. Thank you. We're proud of them. That's for sure. We want to turn down here to the end of the line. At the moment, we got Dr. Mitch Early Wine. He's got a Colleen Breyer, professor at uh, SUNY Albany. And uh, we're obviously targeting, we target a lot of groups here that you would traditionally think uh, aren't supportive of the drug war, law enforcement, and seniors. Uh, look, it's time we can turn a little uh, critical eye to ourselves. Um, Clearly, the decades of drug war have really diminished the trust many cannabis consumers have within the system. And to the point where many of them uh, simply don't vote. They don't go out, they, won't, they don't vote for president, they don't vote for propositions, they've kind of given up that the change can happen the way. And Mitch, if you could uh, discuss that, on what can we do to get more pro already pro cannabis folks involved and you know, see that we can actually change these laws? You'll have to excuse me if I'm not my usual self. I for a second thought I was a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> the clinch I'm here for, the folks in this room and for the folks who really are outside as well, who really aren't like us, if you can have this image in your mind, if you can imagine a little baby in a life vest on the welcome mat at your house, okay? The welcome mat is your property. It's your home. Asset forfeiture could affect any of us. Asset forfeiture started in the 1700s when John Hancock had a schooner filled with Madeira, the wine, 
and he didn't want to play, pay this ridiculous English customs tax on it, and they took it. Okay. That's what pissed us off in the first place. <laughs> sucking up our police re re resources. I can't have somebody come to my house and protect my house if that person is down at City Hall fingerprinting some dude for an eighth. We just can't do it. And it doesn't matter if I've got pot in my house or not. It's that police officer is not available. All right? The baby. The baby. <laughs> Everybody's always talking about save the children, save the children, save the children, save the children. I've been smoking pot 32 years. I've never been carded. <laughs> no dealer has ever said, let me make sure you're over 18. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. But the other thing is, the children can get literally wrecked because of some wreck. You get one bus and suddenly you're not eligible for student loans. You get one bus and suddenly there are jobs that aren't open to you. You get one bus and you can't necessarily go into law enforcement or in some places the legal profession at all. That is just not what we want. Right? So if you can remember, the baby in the life that's on your welcome mat, that's going to be how we're going to get all us to the polls and everybody else on our side. Thank you. Kind of getting towards the end of our time here, but I would like to go down the line once more and just give, a, if you can give a quick a, a minute or so, takeaway message for each of the demographics you spoke towards and or just in general, that where can legalization advocates go to bring in these these final stragglers we need to cross the finish line? And um, if we, I guess we'll start with you, Sabrina. Uh, well, I would say Go with everybody you don't know and have never met. Um, reach out as far outside of your comfort zone as you can because those are pretty much the people that we need to get. We're all, it's easy to talk about it in a room full of legalizers and, it, and with all the support everywhere, but when you're going to talk to your mom or your grandmother, some people are more afraid to bring it up. Uh, so discuss it with the women in your life and talk about it with people who you would otherwise feel uncomfortable. I, I heard that you were speaking to somebody at the airport or... She was in the gym this morning. In the gym ahead. this morning, yeah, yeah, I heard that earlier. You know, exactly, that, that kind of interaction. <laughs> what people in the, on the planes come, one to Vegas and one to Vegas to here, we talk to both of them, of course. <laughs> exactly, that's perfect. That is a perfect example of what people can do and just show them that it's normal, mainstream, productive members of society that believe that this issue is a real, current issue that needs to be solved. Well, I discovered one thing. There's at least three Republicans at this table. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's only three. <laughs> In, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, Baltimore on Saturday for a uh, board meeting of uh, LEAP, and uh, I was watching television the other night. How many of you saw the premiere episode of The Good Wife? <laughs> How many? Well, you know, probably 14, other, 14 million other people saw it besides the folks in this room, and they did an incredible Sub subplot uh, that had to do with uh, asset seizure and the corruption of uh, professional police and uh, the use of uh, canines on the highway uh, like is going on today in uh, Nevada. And uh, so I'm taking an initiative back to LEAP that uh, LEAP, and I'm, I'm bringing this up so that I could encourage you and the organizations that you belong to and normal to uh, Contact the Writers Guild of America and tell them that you can offer expertise 
two writers across the nation. Google writers associations and uh, communicate with them. Tell them you can offer expertise for storytellers. And if you can get the writers of this nation writing about this more than they are now, I think that would be uh, very beneficial. I'm going to make this a major initiative for, I'm going to try to make this a major initiative for the next year. Uh, for, one thing I, I, I forgot to say, and, and I'd like to bring it up because it, it uh, resonates with, with other things said at the table. Listen to what is said and evaluate what's behind it in terms of these announcements. You might recall last year that a big announcement in LA was that uh, the police department was uh, behind 3,000 rape kits. And that was just a terrible thing. Three years, women who have been raped have been waiting for some resolution to the investigations and they scrambled around and said we're going to catch this stuff and they got ten million dollars and they caught it up. But why did it happen in the first place? And if you think about it, at least if you have the expertise to think about it, everyone that's arrested for a drug charge is going to go to court. And they're going to be in court within a certain number of days. And that means that the evidence against them has to be ready. And that means that the laboratory testing, that goes to the head of the queue. That's why they're behind 3,000 rape kids. So they caught up what happened two months ago. We hear now that they're behind 4,000 fingerprint checks. Well, these are laboratory resources. They're behind. They're behind because they're doing all this other stuff because they're not concentrating on giving our detectives leads that have to do with crimes against person, crimes against property. So I, I just mentioned that to you so you can listen hard when these things happen and say, how does the drug war impact this? Which leads me to the final little clip that we might, we might all walk away with today, and that is, when you talk to police officers and police administrators and, and uh, city councils and county councils, you tell them that if you support the war on drugs, you do not support public safety. And that's a fact today. You do not support public safety. Thanks. Well, this is one of the few times in my life when I've been with a Republican majority in any form. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Uh, and I would say only that, you know, be nice to Republicans or anybody who is, <laughs> who is opposed, but is maybe willing, willing to listen, because that's how you're going to change views. And the other thing I would say, last thing, is wear that pen. You know, that's a great conversation starter. You can be sure if somebody asks, uh, maybe they think you're Canadian, but probably <laughs> they recognize that leaf, and if they're asking, you know, they're, they're open, they're willing to, to talk, you have an opportunity to convince somebody, and we do have the facts and the truth on our side, so we don't need to be angry about it, but just calm and, and explain, and, you know, it's one person at a time, but we're, we're getting there. Thank you. I have worn since 1996, thanks to Richard, this pen from the California Initiative, Medical Marijuana. And it has brought on many a conversation, particularly with my white hair, my age, so on. They want to look at it and they don't really believe it. So then they ask about it. Then the next pen, sir, is the leap. I've been wearing leap for some time. And I, uh, you know, I believe in this. I want to follow up. I said earlier that this beloved country, which is the country of the land and the free for most of us, but far too many of other color, it's not. We've had the cancer of racism, now we have the cancer of the drug war. And I think <coughs> those of us who are active in it 
know that we have a lot to do, but it can be done. And now this thing he was talking about, and I'm going to destroy that. I have not mentioned this public anybody. I thought about starting a group. Everybody needs to have a group, don't they? I like to leave. All right, I have a, how about Grant? Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition. <laughs> Thank you, and please stick around for the next panel, which is, I believe, seniors and... <laughs>